I discussed it with Jess. I understood that, that you would go first, okay. mainly because we've taken the title of your talk sure, sure. for the topic of the night. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for changing the title. <laughs> uh, so, basically, I'll try very briefly to um, go through a couple of ideas. First, around toxic whiteness, but also around that issue of which really preoccupies me, preoccupies me in, in the sense of saying, do we need another academic debate, which, which has to do about sort of academics encounter with white supremacists, um, mostly in the public sphere. What and how, what should academics do? And how should, should they think? Uh, white supremacy and its relationship to uh, the environment in which it is uh, thriving. So the first, my first starting point is something which uh, I started working on in White Nation and which has been validated again and again, I, I have to really say, which has to do with the relationship uh, between racial fantasies of whiteness and crisis, and uh, the ter terminology is very important, crisis in the fantasies of uh, upward social mobility. So the term is important because I'm not talking about crisis in social mobility, crisis in the fantasies of upward social mobility. And, this, and the idea of a crisis in the fantasy of upward social mobility has to do with the fact that race itself, uh, whiteness specifically, is a fantasy of upward social mobility and uh, invites and interpolates people to think uh, of it in terms of an expectation that uh, even if I'm not doing so well at the moment. My whiteness offers me the space to dream about the possibility of moving forward. I don't necessarily need to move forward. Do I need to move forward? <laughs> uh, and, but, as long as there is some validation. Fantasies are a bit like this. They're a bit like uh, believing in the, no. Uh, they're a bit like the way people believe in saints. You know, uh, in the sense that a saint doesn't have to succeed in every single mi miracle. It's enough <laughs> that one or two, sort of like you're convinced that it's done the job, one or two, you believe in the saint. And uh, even if 20, 30, 40 times I don't get up with social mobility, but one and two is enough to make me believe in the fantasy of uh, up with social mobility. And so the idea of a crisis in this is that, that we were engaging in social situations where even this minimal confirmation of uh, upward social mobility was in crisis. And this came across in my uh, work with the Hansenites 25 years ago onwards. The idea was that they felt, and I use the term stuck, they felt a crisis of what I called stuckedness, which was bad English, but it stuck. <laughs> and everybody now talks about stuckedness, which I'm very, very pleased. <laughs> that I've introduced an English word to them. <laughs> so, so the idea is then, just to give you a quick imaginary of what, what it means, this, this crisis of upward social, mo uh, fantasies of upward social mobility, is that there's a mobility envy. It creates mobility envy. So, 
uh, you have a, a migrant who comes and moves next to you in Marrickville, uh, in Sydney, and the day they arrived, they had a bike. And you have a Toyota, 1917, not mm -hmm. fantastic, but you have a 1970 Toyota, they've got a bike. Next, the year after, they get a motorbike. And the motorbike is in no way as good as having your Toyota 1970. But you look and you say, they moved from bike to motorbike, and I'm stuck with my Toyota. <laughs> so the comparison is a comparison of mobility. And, and so, and that's why it wasn't always a question of working class people, it was a question of a variety of classes, but experiencing this sense of stuckness. And where it became incredibly important, uh, uh, the manifestation of this crisis was, was in uh, the racism directed very specifically at hospitals. Now, I became very interested in this because, uh, you know, in classical theory and classical, classical philosophy, you know, I'm trained to think in terms of Indo-European categories of division of society, you know, the priest um, on one hand, the warrior, on the other, like you can find them in Benveniste, in Dumézil's work, the priest, the warrior, and the cultivator. And in many societies, uh, priests hood or the army are means of upward social mobility for working class people, or peasants, or, or what have you. And, uh, very interestingly, um, if you look at white supremacists, they have created an alternative means of being priests and warriors. If you look at their websites, etc., this is how they think of themselves, alternative academics, alternative uh, warriors. They haven't joined the army and they don't have any academic credentials, but they think existing academic credentials are bullshit and they are warriors. And so they have moved along these means. The only one missing is the halo. Because unfortunately they can muck around and act as if they are alternative academics and they can muck around and act as alternative uh, warriors, but they can't muck around and act as alternative doctors. They have to go to the hospital. And when they go to the hospital, what they see is Asian doctors and nurses. And this became a total obsession, this idea of going to a hospital and saying, what's going on here? Indian doctor, uh, Afghani nurse, what's, what the hell, sort of like, and they, and this, because the doctor position is really such an important fantasy position of upward social mobility. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it has been occupied by somebody that should not have occupied it, it's like a blockage. It's like, because it's, it's not that this person thinks this Indian is stopping me from being a doctor. Mm -hmm. No, what's important is this Indian is stopping me from thinking that we whites will be the doctors. This is what I mean by the breakage in the fantasy of uh, And it is in that process that we have toxic whiteness, warrior whiteness, a, a kind of like damaged whiteness that believes there's a betrayal that's been happening. And the uh, I, uh, I'm always very influenced by my work on Lebanon when I analyze Australia. Uh, 
especially the fact that my work on, Leb on Lebanese war was between Christians versus Muslims, etc. Look at replication of some of these these logics as they uh, emerge. And I kind of like was working with some ex-Christian militiamen who were kept talking to me about defeat and how they are defeated in Lebanon and how the Muslims have won and they've taken over and etc. And after a while, I thought they were depressed because they were defeated. And then it dawned on me that these people were very unsuccessful socioeconomically. They did not manage to do well in post-war society. And they were, in a way, faced with two alternatives. Either they say, yeah, I'm a punk. I am useless, I'm unemployed. Or they say, I'm a defeated warrior. Mm -hmm. Now, which would you choose mm -hmm. as a fantasy of valorization? <coughs> of course, you say, I'm a defeated warrior. Uh, sort of like, I'm going to plan resistance, I'm going to. So the warrior ethos is an alternative fantasy of viability when your socioeconomic status is no longer providing you with fantasies and means of viability. And this is what we find with white warriors here. They cling to fighting, etc., as an alternative fantasy of viability. It's like someone who makes a living on social media, and they're probably might be nothing outside social media. And the only place where there are something is on social media. And so they like to stay on social media. Like, why would you want to retreat if it makes you face something or another which is unpleasant about you? So, so that's, that's the basis of toxic whiteness. Second <coughs> move. I'm probably taking too much time, but I have to. Uh, but uh, the second move that I'm interested in is the complicity that, m that exists between this toxic whiteness and whiteness in general. <laughs> and the fact that there is an element in which from being a located, localizable, governmental problem, this toxicity becomes an environmental problem. What we say by this, when toxic thing becomes an environmental problem, it becomes diffused throughout the atmosphere, not just somewhere. And so I'm, I was interested in the principle of the diffusion of this toxicity. Why is it not this kind of like combativeness, etc., is not just white supremacists. It comes to Hansenites. It doesn't come to Hansenites. It comes to the Labour Party and the Liberal Party. You find it moving in a variety of ways, more or less intensity, but present nonetheless throughout, uh, throughout the social. And I became particularly interested in the way this combativeness and warlike position was often used in something that reminded me of uh, a nuclear deterrence, mutual deterrence. Some of us who are old enough to remember the struggles around MAD, a mutual assured destruction, mutual, etc. And the idea is that I'm sitting at the table, smiling, and let's have a civilized discussion. But I'm reminding you that behind me is this seriously nasty thing that is going to get you if you don't behave, <laughs> right? And so what you have is a usage of white supremacy, in particular this kind of way, that is white people who smile at you and look exceptionally sort of like civilized, but at the same time they're telling you, don't fuck around with me because I will let loose my real wild people on you if you don't <laughs> really behave. That is, there is a diffused racism, racism as a disciplinary technique in the generalized population through the usage of this white supremacy by very 
smiley, civilized white people occupying very supposedly civilized position. And so this toxicity develops in this way. And so I want to move finally to very quickly to the last central question for me, which has to do with how do I interact with this as an intellectual, as an academic? When I started working on this, I've gone through the phase of being childish and going ha ha ha. I've gone through the ha 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 phase and sort of like using quotes from people and mocking them and saying sort of like, oh, isn't that funny the way these people think and isn't that etc. And then I moved to the phase of, oh, we must understand. Oh, we must understand Hansenites. Oh, we must understand the social conditions of production, uh, etc. Oh, no, it's no good for us academics to sort of like be critical uh, of they represent a decent section of the population and we should sort of like be understanding and what have you. But then I was coming to the point where actually, okay, so I understand, but these people don't understand me. I mean, why should I be the one constantly bloody understanding that? <laughs> you know, if they don't reciprocate some understanding towards me as, as a person. And uh, slowly it came down to this <coughs> idea that, in fact, these people, precisely because they think of themselves as an alternative intellectual order, have zero respect for me. They, in fact, hate me. They, in fact, think I am part of their problem and that, in fact, they really wish to harm me. And I'm not kidding here. They really materially wish to harm me. <coughs> and so the issue, when I deal with inter uh, university saying engagement, engagement, <laughs> became <laughs> quite interesting here, sort of like, how do you engage with someone who wants to harm you, you know, <laughs> sort of like, what kind of engagement does that open for you as, as an academic? The first thing was that was necessary to stop myself thinking <coughs> was that the world is not one big tutorial room, you know. <laughs> no, <coughs> the white supremacists don't want to have an interesting discussion with me. <laughs> and I'm not leading a tutorial here. Their categories are not categories of understanding and analysis. Their categories are categories deployed to hurt people. I have to understand the condition of efficiency of their categories. They're not what they are saying about. And so I have to read myself from thinking that the worst thing that racists can do is some kind of like intellectual fault, like essentialism, <laughs> you know? Oh, no, how dare you? You have engaged in essentialism, as if the racist is going to say, oh, no, I didn't think right. Oh, sorry about this. <laughs> sort of like, you know, as if it was some kind of like intellectual problem here that we are dealing with. The, the racist is saying, I want to be efficient and hurt. In fact, if I'm all over the place and I hurt, fine by me. I'm not interested in being academically rigorous. So we have to deal with the condition of efficiency of racist speech as warrior speech. Secondly, for me, sort of like, so how do I deal? And I will finish with this because I think I've taken enough time. Uh, how do we deal with the fact that <coughs> if people want to harm you, and I don't take it, I know in Australia it's a bit hard to think this, but I genuinely uh, draw part of my intellectual tradition from uh, people like Walter Benjamin, etc. people who died, killed. So uh, <coughs> the idea of being killed by a white supremacist is not a hypothesis for me like this. These people can hurt us in a seriously material way. And always the intellectuals are the ones 
when there is authoritarian rule who get killed, and they happily jumping in the prairie, picking up flowers, and they die without noticing that this is. And so we have to take seriously that. The question is, it would be easy to say, OK, these people want to kill you, they're fighters. Well, let's fight against them. <coughs> In fact, you know and I know we're not fighters. We academics are wimps in general, <laughs> sort of like, let alone being fighters, sort of like in a, serious, in a serious manner. But what's more important, really, is that the fact that these people thrive on warring conditions. We academics don't thrive on warring conditions. Our condition, the social conditions in which we exist and which we thrive is slowly reflecting on things, etc. These people want the world to become a warring scene. So if we interact with them just as warriors, they get what they want. So there is that issue of, so how do you interact with someone who wants to do <coughs> war with you? And you know it's serious, but you don't want to create war conditions. And I'll finish very, very quickly with one word intellectual criminalization. I think what we need to engage in is more in a technique that I want to call intellectual criminalization. That is, instead of treating them as an enemy warrior, I think we should treat them as criminals. I think we should uh, maybe uh, the criminal is not something uh, that the justice system and the police system are necessarily on our side, but they could be. But also we have to be careful since the police and et cetera itself is not immune from the circulation of white supremacy, et cetera. We all know this very well. So, so the question of criminal, intellectual criminalization means how do I take seriously criminalizing some form intellectually? Uh, criminalizing, that is, you're a criminal. <laughs> you're a white criminal. <coughs> and I want to use the concept of white criminal as an analytic category. And we know that crime is not equally intense and equally distributed, and not everyone's crime is as serious as the other. But I think there's a lot of white criminals in this society. And there's a history of white criminality, of course which is colonial, which we, we have to draw on to fully understand how we seriously, intellectually, but also with an awareness of the seriousness of the problem uh, we can deal with. Everyone hear me? I'm an ex-teacher, so I've got a very good booming voice to, <laughs> to draw on. So um, first, thanks, Melinda, for the invitation to speak tonight and to participate in which is obviously a really pressing issue um, of our time. And um, so I'm a researcher principally interested in um, understanding and addressing social inequality and thinking about the dynamics of power that create marginality, advantage, disadvantage, privilege, um, and of course the intensive inequalities in pay and wealth that we see today. So to that end, I research social institutions like <coughs> education and work, um, and think about these as key sites of inequality, but also as key sites of resistance, of spaces and sites in which we make ourselves and in which we make our collective and our community. So what I'm interested in is the form and function of contemporary capitalism, the public policies that it produces, how it's diversely lived and felt, and how people make, um, live through and make sense of this reality. And of course, it's impossible to address this research agenda without thinking about race and racism, although I think some people do try. Um, questions of power, of material disadvantage, of struggle, of social change, are invariably steeped in the politics of racism. Um, to borrow from cultural theorist Stuart Hall, um, these things are articulated by race. So it's inevitable that experiences of racism and subjectification of race emerge in the sort of research that I do. 
So when um, Melinda first asked me to be a part of this discussion and reflecting on um, the rise of the far right, or perhaps more accurately, the mainstreaming of the far right that we're seeing at the moment, and the um, atrocious acts of terrorist violence in Christchurch, my thoughts immediately le led to a consideration of power and inequality and how that relates to race, of the need for a wider conceptualization of race and racism <coughs> that connects the problem of white nationalist sentiment with an analysis of inequality under capitalism. So I thought what I could contribute to this discussion is to step back, is to offer some reflections on the wider context within which toxic whiteness and racist violence emerges, and to consider also some of the limitations and dangers of what I see as a bit of a taken for granted position of the progressive response. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But to start, I want to offer some reflections on the broader dynamics of power in which racism flourishes. And I think that <coughs> one of the things that we need to um, seriously think about is the fact that capitalism rests upon and I think requires marginality and division. These divisions are not just material in terms of the distribution of resources, but they are bred through affective economies of disgust. And I'm thinking here about the feelings and the sensations of failure, of abjection, of despair. These are the sorts of divisions that capitalism requires and fundamentally lead to a tendency towards dehumanization. The circulation, the circulation of the ideas of abjection is one of the central ways in which humans can and are dehumanized in our current world. There is a distance that's created between humans in our world that's around the abject other. Sociologist Saskia Sassen talks about this as the expulsion of capitalism, the way in which um, our global hierarchies of power and wealth literally rely on expelling communities, on expelling people, on expelling ecosystems and land more broadly. Um, in my own research, in my recent book on precarious enterprise on the margins, I've investigated this in relationship to homelessness. How, for instance, it is that homelessness and in particular the bodies of homeless people are so easily understood publicly and politically as the refuse of broader society, as if they are separate from our broader relations. In relation to race, abjection circulates to make possible serious practices of expulsion. And it's not hard to think of some examples. In our national context, we can see this around the discursive imagery of refugees. It's also abundantly clear in relation to Australia's First Nations people the ways in which abjection is used to make colonial patterns of violence possible, palatable, and of course, institutional. So capitalism's expulsions occur along a range of axes. It's about race, but it's also about inequality, and it's ultimately about maintaining a particular set of social arrangements that have both economic and ideological interests in relationship to the settler colonialism. So I found myself thinking in the aftermath of Christchurch about Susan Sontag's reflections in her um, beautiful extended essay regarding the pain of others, uh, where she talks about um, the imagery and knowledge of pain or the wounds of others, and how that can sometimes not lead to greater uh, humanity, but actually to inhumanity, to violence and dehumanism. She writes, harrowing photographs do not inevitably lose their power to shock, but they are not much help if the task is to understand. Narratives can make us understand. Photographs do something else. They haunt. So to think about the Australian context in which questions of race are imbricated in the heated question of the national border, the images and knowledge of refugees, of the horrific condition of de within detention centres, all haunt. But these hauntings can invoke a multitude of judgments and understandings. The spectacle, if you will, of refugee suffering, of the violence of detention, of trauma, can in fact confirm their, their inhumanity, the, their otherness. In other words, there is a potentiality to literally border the pain of others through a recognition of their pain if there is a narration that's created around a territorial imagined community, around fear and around um, uh, a racist violence. So the point here is that capitalism relies upon borders, exclusions, and expulsions. And these are steeped in the logics and maintenance of current power and inequality. 
and that these in turn cultivate an abject and dehumanizing politics which create racism and racist violence. What I really want to emphasize here is that these dynamics of exclusion are characteristic of the core of our society. They're not some fringe element that are brought in on occasion that we kind of see murmuring up. They're constitutive of our social arrangements. So even when we look at the pinnacle institutions of our modern day state, we can see that they are premised on this idea of exclusion and on a, a certain cohort of our society that, that are constantly left behind. So if we think about the systems of education, which according to our um, current treasurer, Josh, Josh Frydenberg is, and I quote in his budget speech, the first defense of a nation. We can see this at work. Schools and universities are steeped in the fantasy of meritocracy. Mm. The notion that excellence, achievement, and even intelligence is naturally reflected in these hierarchies of knowledge, these testings and ranks that we give to students from the age of three <laughs> in some cases, but certainly like when we think about the um, introduction of NAPLAN and so on, um, to students all through their um, schooling life in schools and even the way that universities is, higher, um, is ranked. We can see that these rely on the expulsion, the exclusion of some. Our systems of education structurally rely on winners and losers. These embedded use of tests and ranks um, do this through ensuring that they are constantly not allowing some in. So what I'm trying to get at is that practices of exclusion are the bread and butter of modern democratic institutions. And this kind of positioning is actively supported by mainstream politics and policy, which frame, for instance, refugees like queue jumpers or those who are receiving welfare on social benefits, to use Joe Hockey's words, as leaners as opposed to lifters. So these are bordering practices in the sense that they create borders between deserving and undeserving, the educated, the uneducated, the so-called legitimate citizens and non-citizens <coughs> of productive and unproductive. Indeed, whilst we live in a time of intense, intensive globalization, we need to face the reality that our nations are actually bordering up in striking ways um, rather than this kind of idea of an open global citizenship. And these bordering practices have material repercussions. They, you know, um, such as denying access for social welfare for asylum seekers um, and other structural inequalities, but they also have affective qualities. They create the conditions within notions and feelings of belonging and community and nationhood are cultivated. So these borders are not just the physical borders of our nation, but the practices of its social institutions. So what I want to think about here is how do we respond to this context? How do we respond to this context and its products, such as violent and institutional racism? So in an um, a couple of years ago, I conducted a close textual analysis of um, a booklet that was called Preventing Violent Extremism and Radicalization in Australia. Some of you might be familiar with it. In 2015, it was preemptively sent to all schools in Australia, and this preemptive sending the government did it um, off its own bat led to many of the academics who'd been consulted on this booklet to distance themselves from it because um, it wasn't their understanding of its intention. Um, this book attempted to kind of offer some examples of radicalization and it, and it attempted to offer a flattened understanding of radicalization. So it took care to include some far right examples and some left wing examples. And you, remi you might remember this book for the controversy of Karen. Karen was a made up character and she was the example of left wing activism and she fit all the stereotypes. She listened to alternative music, gasp. <laughs> Um, but she also participated in protests where she damaged property and trespassed, gasp. Um, but Karen was a good news st story in the booklet. Ultimately, and I'm not sure how she saw the error of her ways, but she did. Uh, she worked out that that wasn't a good way to carry on. Um, and so she eventually joined a mainstream environmental organisation to advocate for change within the system, within the rules of the law. So at the time I wanted to analyse this booklet to examine how educational institutions like schools are used by nation states to cultivate particular versions of good and proper citizenship and the ways in which this constrains our understanding and our imaginary of democracy and how it germinates racism. But ultimately this booklet 
creates a version of Australian democracy in which the rule of law is represented as providing safety as the appropriate resolution for our feelings of injustice, disassociation and disaffection and frustration. The neat resolution for Karen is a turn to a change within the system rather than a more radical position which of course questions the legal and political systems that appear completely inept at bringing forward an agenda of environmental justice. So this fuels an understanding that democratic institutions of the West are unproblematic. They're violent free, they're open to change even and dare I say it, they, that it, it, it presumes this kind of race neutral stance. But we know that democratic institutions of the West have been and are violent, problematic, and have been proven to be structurally racist. There is, in other words, a link between the various and ways in which marginalization is constructed, how people are excluded and expelled in society, to the discursive crafting and bordering of the Western democratic good life, which takes for granted the goodness of its pinnacle democratic institutions and practices like the law and even like schools and universities and the sort of work that I do. So in a research agenda that I've been pursuing with colleagues uh, Sophie Brudoff at the University of Melbourne and Arathi Sripakash at the University of Cambridge, we've been examining the ways in which seemingly left liberal defences of education and academic research can in fact obfuscate and enhance deep and abiding structures of racism that underpin them. To take a practical example, in the face of neoliberal technocratic attacks on the humanities and social sciences, there's often a very fierce defense of academic disciplines as being the foundational features of democratic life as the places for deep um, critical thinking. And this can seem a really easy, take it for granted kind of progressive step to take. But we suggest that such defences can actually herald and celebrate the contribution of Western knowledge in ways that overlook how these disciplines and how these knowledge making institutions are created on the back of racist presumptions and colonial practices, are created on the back of, violent, of the violence of colonial pseudoscientific presumptions. The kind of celebration of the shine of academic knowledge, its possibility, its connection to individual and collective coming, becoming, can overlook its shadow. The ways in which this idea of becoming is actually linked to a long history of modernist enlightenment ideas of progress in distinction from the colonised other. In my own research, I've been taking this a bit further to think about the ways in which democratic life is defended through a seemingly left agenda in response to contemporary far-right populism. So if we look at some of the progressive responses to the far right, there's, an often, there's often a response that a key antidote is gotta be education. If we can somehow educate people out of their racism, then that might be a solution. Or perhaps that it's ignorance and a lack of knowledge that produces racism. And that's what we need to address. What this does, however, is overlook the ways in which very educated and elite people are at the heart of bringing around far-right politics into the mainstream. You might remember in the middle of the Trump campaign, he infamously declared when he had just been uh, um, voted in with the Nevada con uh, caucus, he was um, running to become the Republican um, nominee, that he loved the poorly educated. Progressives pounced on this as demonstrative of the disregard that Trump has for the knowledge and expertise of educational institutions like universities. And of course it's true, he does have a complete disregard for what we would consider to be traditional forms of um, expertise. I don't think our response should be though that to line up um, and uh, justify the worthiness of these institutions without qualification. The problem with doing that is that it supports the existing unequal arrangements of these systems of education and of our social life. And it uh, can fuel the, the existing representation that those who are already excluded from our education systems or expelled from our social arrangements are doing so in a kind of, uh, or has happened in a kind of logical or necessary way. Rather, we need to excavate further the ways in which education and broader society is structurally riddled with these expulsions and exclusions. I mean, 
What does it mean for those people who are perpetually excluded from our systems of education when we insist that it's through education that better and higher forms of knowledge are formed? And I'm thinking here not just of national social arrangements but global social arrangements. And what kind of relationship is this establishing and presuming between the work of educators and those who are excluded from it, between the educated and the uneducated? So I think the seemingly progressive support for education can slip into a support for our existing unequal social arrangements and fail to address the ways in which these divisions occur through the existing knowledge practices of capitalism. There's no kind of bygone time for us to look back and think, oh, that was a good time that the university was functioning. I think we just need to take a few decades back to see how dysfunctional higher education was in relationship to um, inequity. So I want to suggest that the, um, our so-called democracy has long carried a host of exclusions and oppressions and, subject, and subjectifications within its norms and logics, and that these at their heart are supported by expert-making institutions. So the uneducated ed and educated distinction is a direct product of that. So I want to end these reflections by suggesting that our response to the rising current of far-right violence and politics must resist celebrating or defending our existing social arrangements, but to think about other ways of offering a countervailing um, current to racism. We need to face the material, discursive and affective inequities and expulsions that underpin our social arrangements and actually take aim at those who currently benefit from these. Good example of uh, the usage of white supremacy as a missile in a game of deterrence. Now, when you have a missile behind you and you want to deter people, it's a very arty job. Like, you want to make sure that the missile is scary. But at the same time, uh, there was this thing called uh, the fear of first strike, you know, and which was the idea that the missile that you are controlling behind you as you are negotiating will go loose. And so you want to make sure it's not going all over the place or taking over. And if you look at the history of Hansenism, you find that 
it is continuously expanding but being disciplined as well. Make sure it's there, everybody feels it, it's present, but if it gets too strong, then you discipline it back. And it was very interesting talking about this current election because two days ago we saw exactly that process. <laughs> Hansen was disciplined and the forces of Hansenism were regressing, 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 and the white media, Hansenite assemblage, came and presented us with Hansen in tears, <laughs> which provided, said, oh no, let's let her live again. <laughs> we don't want 4%, we want 10%. That will scare non-whites better in the game of the term. And I would argue this is not necessarily some kind of like conspiracy uh, theory where someone is the mastermind. This is part of the logic of the institution to create these kind of like balances and check these waves the way they go. And so, yeah, so I mean, for, for me, that is why the issue of criminalization. So to, to me, I want to now feel like I, I say, Hansen appearing on this show was a criminal act. I want to stay uh, in a straightforward manner and argue, I don't, as I said, I would love it if uh, the criminal court and the police catch up with my intellectual criminalization and lead to actual criminalization, but I'm not gonna wait for it, right? I'm going to engage, that's why I'm I'm saying take seriously uh, criminalization as an intellectual movement first. That is, we have to create an intellectual space where criminalizing means something for us. And if somebody else catches up, great. But we're not gonna wait. Um. So I was just, I don't think I was painting quite as grim reality. Maybe it was quite grim, but I, I guess I, I, to the question around social forces in the present moment, I mean, I don't think um, it would be naive to say that uh, anything but that this is a particular moment that we're in where there are heightened, heightened feelings of fear um, and a heightened assertion of toxic whiteness. Um, but in that moment, I think the power of it also displays its fragility. Um, it's a project that has to be asserted again and again through violent acts. Um, and at the moment we're seeing you know, a particular arisal of it that's, that's incredibly fierce. But I, I, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't think that, that it, it means that we kind of hands down, that's it. I think it, it actually, um, demands, of course, that we do something, that we have to, and I'm, maybe we're not warriors, but <laughs> I think, you know, we still have to respond. Um, and of course, the question of how to respond is the biggest question that's facing us at the moment. But um, in thinking through questions of, you know, the, the federal election coming up, the possibilities there, I think what, what I'm trying to suggest is that if we see the avenue for change is purely through the existing institutions of our social arrangements of to the day, then we will never win this fight. We have to see it as being um, uh, carried out through through uh, through the through uh, through change within those institutions, but a, a force of change that's actually demanding something much bigger. I think one of the issues is obviously the fact that, I mean, I'm trying to uh, restrict myself to think strictly in terms of what as an academic, but of course we live also in a space where there's massive activism not within the institutions that is happening and that we need to link up to. But I think it is also very important to not hide from uh, the scale of defeat that we exist in today. I mean, 
I've been in this business for a long time, right? Uh, I have seen my writings 25 years ago resurface. And people say to me, you must be so happy that white nation, everybody <laughs> is using it again and everybody, and it's very depressing at one level because it shows how useless the whole bloody thing was. Uh, and uh, also, what I mean by the scale of defeat, right? We have been defeated. I think if you don't take the fact that we have been defeated as a starting point, there's a problem to me. Uh, you know, where we were and what we were aspiring for, et cetera, and where we are now, you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. You haven't done well, and you are said to be a defeated warrior. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, so we, we will open up for questions. Perhaps p people who are not sitting in the front row I might ask you to to speak up and to stand up and speak your question directly. Gasan is hard of hearing, so that might just help the process. Um, but the, the floor is yours. Questions or comments for either or both of our speakers. Yes, um, I think both the speakers um, mentioned things in passing that could form some way through the impasse, which is on the one hand capital and the other the start of it, which is settler colonialism, which is the original sin of the large ultra-nationalist white supremacism that is, you know, that, that is um, fueling all of the other aspects of the toxic whiteness that you went on, both went on to describe. So perhaps the, these shadow terms, uh, because they're directly interlinked as well, uh, a transformative way through. Uh, you know, centering in indigeneity and transforming, well, absolutely smashing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and there's certainly many inspiring things happening in that space. I mean, both nationally but also globally, if we think about the roads must fall movement, thinking about particularly in the university context, I think that that's a really uh, important movement for us to think about as academics who want to respond to toxic whiteness um, and to think about the linking I mean I think the separation between academic work and activism is sometimes necessary but also highly problematic at times and I think sometimes and I guess this is what I'm getting at with the institutional limits sometimes we can kind of see our own work as being that means an end to activism or the means an end to trying to enact social change as opposed to its connection to other worlds and other sorts of actions. And um, I think that that's the sorts of kind of, when we're thinking about how to connect and how to move beyond, I think we have to be thinking about that. We have to, I mean, we have to have uh, concrete strategies Of, of hurting, <laughs> uh, ideologically at least, which is where we live, uh, uh, white supremacists. I mean, sometimes I think uh, you might be surprised, but I do think about the validity and usefulness of using the category white. Uh, I have no problem, I've never had a problem using it. <laughs> Uh, analytically, and I've used it in my academic work, but at the same time, if someone is deriving power out of this category, I mean, this identification white for the white supremacists, you know, it's a magical act, as some of uh, my colleagues here know, <coughs> sort of like, it's a very wonderful transformative act whereby when you say, I'm white, suddenly you speak in the name of Beethoven. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so, so, like, so you've got this punk who has saying that he represents Beethoven, right? <laughs> and, and, they say, and he's defending Western civilization. 
and Beethoven wouldn't touch him with a ten foot pole, right? But he is representing Beethoven. Now, what's the point of continuing to calling him white, which reproduces this collective identification? I mean, why not say to him, this person, well, you know, if you're white, you're just a real bad specimen, let's face it. <laughs> or, you know, you know, I mean, the fact is sort of like, you know, I've, I've used this rhetorically myself when some people have said, I, I, I've said to them, because I said, well, you know, if the white race is so great, how come it produces idiots like you? <laughs> sort of like. And so, so there is this sense where you can de-identify whiteness from these people, and there is, but I know that the cost of it is to let off the hook many whites who actually should be covered by this category critically. So, so it's, but it is an interesting space for thinking, for instance, strategically, about the difference between using academic categories and deploying something in the public sphere. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks. That was great. Uh, really engaging. So you spoke a bit about defeat and a bit about warriors and the, the warrior ethos animating uh, these groups, which I found very persuasive and very, uh, you know, very illuminating. But then you came back to criminalization as the response to warriors. Now, I don't know how much, his, maybe I haven't read enough history, but I always thought warriors need warriors. Need warriors, but that's, that's, yeah. I mean, that's the issue to me. I'm not a warrior. You, and what I'm arguing is that if you are, well, I am a warrior, by the way, but <laughs> that's, uh, but in a kind of different way. But what, my point is this, that, if you go to this warrior and say, I'm fighting you as a warrior, first, you legitimate them as warriors. You legitimate them as warriors. I think there is an issue about delegitimizing them as warriors. And certainly, that they're fighting in the name of X, Y, Z. So there's an intellectual work to disentangle what they are fighting in the name of. Secondly, you create a war zone. This is where they thrive. Intellectuals don't thrive in war, war zones. You know, I'm just talking about the specificity of what I, as an intellectual, so maybe uh, some activists want to do warrior stuff, fine, mm -hmm. and I might support it, but we're talking about specificity of social traditions yeah, and what one can do from their position. So it's not some kind of like abstract, they're warriors, they need warriors. They said, what, what do you, as an academic, do, do you want to reproduce the warrior discourse? Uh, yeah, so I mean, anyway, it's an open, your work. So I feel like it's a space, obviously what I'm offering here is more a space for thinking. These issues are hardly conclusive about Biko and then Mark. Yep. Um, thank you both. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let's say that I do buy the intellectual criminalization uh, proposition. I think it's actually very seductive and it could potentially work. But I would like to hear a little bit more from you what the, what the law, but for what law are we criminalizing people, white people, if they are the ones that are instituting the law that we're going to be using to criminalize them. When the, when the uh, evidence that we can produce is sometimes incommensurable within the law system that whiteness produces. So how do you negotiate that? How, how can I think through that? Do you want to talk a bit more about that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, which law are you really talking about in terms of? I don't know the one that we will be using to criminalize <laughs> intellectual people. I, I, I actually do have a, a specific battle that I'm fighting right now with intellectual property. 
key, and um, that you, your concept could be useful for, but I cannot find a way in which I can articulate um, Thank you, yeah. the case to be able yes. to, to criminalize it. And, and I, think it, I think it's useful, but how do we go about the, the, the law system that would... Okay. Mm -hmm. You see, I mean, the, if you look at um, the dialectic between uh, warring and policing. So warring creates the other as an enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, policing, it creates the other as a problem. And uh, it is an interesting thing in the history of colonialism, how uh, colonial powers themselves oscillate between defining the colonized as an enemy or as a policing problem. So sort of like, uh, we've seen it here, or we see it in Palestine con continuously, sort of like, as the Israeli army fighting the Palestinians as an enemy, or is the Palestinian a policing problem? And so you oscillate between the two depending on, on how useful it is for you. And maybe we should do the same in this sense. Uh, now, uh, the question then is uh, insane and criminalizing rather than treating as warrior would be to say, you're a social problem. I don't believe you're fighting in the name of anything grandiose. You're just a petty social problem. So I, that's what attracts me to the notion of criminalizing uh, white supremacists. I, reading them of an aura of the great warrior, uh, whatever, and just say you're a petty social problem. So now, this work can be done at an intellectual level through the manipulation of symbolic power. Now, to what extent, then, it can move from the domain of intellectual power into the domain of the law has to do, uh, I would imagine, also with struggle within the law as a field uh, and, uh, and within the police as a field as well, uh, to what extent. It's not impossible, you know. I mean, there is criminalization of all kinds of like legal, I'm sure you know, and sort of like so. So it's a question of widening that. That's, so when I say, when I say I want to be able to look at that interview with Hansen and say this is a criminal act, I know <laughs> the law is not going to say, you're right, actually. <laughs> I can see your point of view. <laughs> uh, but I feel um, it's already subversive for me to throw it in and start saying, well, come on, what about, what do you think of this? Even the, the law saying no to me is already the fact that it had to face the possibility and say no at this stage is still a good thing for me. Mark. Uh, Jess, uh, your talk was quite resonant for me with the debate within the Democrats about Trump. Basically, you have um, one, one view that, uh, I don't know if it's called the Biden, or it's called the Biden uh, pitch, but it was absolutely what you're describing. was sort of like, there's, there's been this admiration, mm -hmm. America is a great, Civilization, the great citadel, has been corrupted by this horrible event, Trumpism, and we now have to restore that and lock himself to the age of that. Um, whereas you have on the opposite side um, the kind of left Democrats who, are, who say no, Trump is the logical consequence of a whole lot of things that are wrong with, in American society. Um, so, first of all, I suppose I was wondering whether you would um, recognize that kind of resonance and whether, going to Melinda's question about hope, whether do you see any, any kind of value in that, in that uh, I suppose, struggle on, on the, the left and that side of the left? They would be doing the sorts of things you're wanting to see happen. Um, I, think, I 
think any political position at the moment that purports <coughs> that the answer is... I mean, it's interesting to me that Trump is trying to make America great again and then Biden is trying to make America great again. You know, like, <laughs> right. So, and there's this narrative of return, of kind of if we can just get back, if we can just kind of muster an imagined past of of the nation state and, and, and conjure that into the present, um, which is just such a dangerous position for um, progressives to hold. That, but that, uh, to me, that that... That space, that political space, is completely unfruitful. Like there's just nothing can be won from trying to recuperate. Um, and we see that um, in Australia as well when we, th you know, people talk about, oh, you know, free education of the 1970s and 80s wasn't that brilliant? My, did you look at who was enrolled in universities in those decades? Did you look at the institutional racism in schools in those decades? I mean, there was just so many terrible things happening that to recuperate that, it, it, they, those things didn't exist in isolation from the other kind of institutional problems that were happening at the same time. So, yes, I think that um, I think the the that uh, political current is is dangerous, and I think that anything that's attempting to actually um, engage a politics that um, accepts the violence of the past and present and tries to think about what next in a way that doesn't fold back onto the past is one that is worth engaging with. Whether or not the left of the Democrat Party had it, have it or not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say, but you know, I think that, that that's the starting point for a discussion of our future. I was struck <clears throat> in both of you talking about the fantasy, I think Jess, you said, um, steeped in the fantasy of meritocracy and Gassan's, um, you know, the, the fantasies of upward social mobility. So I guess I wanted maybe to hear a little bit more about what, what the, is the problem that that fantasy and are there other fantasies that could be less toxic? Other fantasies that can be less toxic. <laughs> I don't know. Really, I just saw you both talking about fantasies of social mobility. I wanted you to talk across that. Yeah. <coughs> I, well, yes. I think fantasy is, um, you know, it's, yeah, interesting because I think Sarah Madison's recent book has also used fantasy. What is a fantasy? Colonialism? Settler colonialism? Yeah. Um, I think fantasy is, uh, like, it's an important concept to capture the, um, uh, what's the term that Lauren Ballant uses? Cruel optimism. The kind of cruel optimism of, mm. of kind of present day um, social arrangements where we're constantly striving, never quite yeah. getting. There's a, you know, there's a, um, there, there is an underpinning um, knife in it because it, it, it's never fulfilled. Even for those who reach the pinnacle of the fantasy moment, so that the people, you know, who kind of make their way through social mobility or through the halls of meritocracy, it, it's never quite enough. It's, you're, you're never quite there. Um, so I'm not sure if there's another more productive <laughs> fantasy because I feel like that that's that it's upon those fantasies that I think many of the the symbolic violence and material violence occurs in contemporary society. Mm. But I don't know if you've got a more hopeful fantasy in mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, an, alter an alternative um, to climate, right? I mean, can we in the university say, well, actually, we're not better than the uneducated, you know, the great unwashed? Like wouldn't we want <coughs> wouldn't yeah. we want that to not be a fantasy, a bit of reality though? Well, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> I but, don't know. But, we, but, but we're professionally invested in producing more and more credentials and more and more right. inequality and stuff. And so, is there an alternative vision for education? Maybe. Mm. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think yeah, I'm an endless source of alternative fantasies, you know. I said I'm an endless source of alternative <laughs> fantasies. <laughs> I can go on forever about them. <laughs> uh, I think uh, fantasy sort of like, for me, uh, sort of like it's a foundational concept. 
uh, related to what I call fantasy of viability. So, so fantasy of viability means the way we stage ourselves in the world to make to think of ourselves as having a viable life, as that our life is worth living and in pursuing things. Uh, that's why a fantasy uh, stages you as someone in pursuit of something, not someone who has achieved something. So like a national fantasy stages the nationalist. A white fantasy sort of like in the same way a stage of the white nation. But uh, so the fantasy does not create a happy person. Like you're not going to find any happy nationalist anywhere. <laughs> I mean, do you know any happy nationalist? <laughs> Let me know. Uh, so the uh, sort of like the idea is that I'm pursuing my nation, and my nation is a real problem, and I want, and so it gives me, yeah. But I think we have ecological fantasies, we have intellectual fantasies. Um, I mean, Marx, when Marx says, uh, philosophy theory becomes a material force when it grips the masses. That's an intellectual fantasy, in the sense that we intellectuals start looking for people that are gripped by our ideas. <laughs> and you look and see, whoa, look at them. They are forming into a mass because of my ideas. And I am so relevant because <laughs> my ideas, oh, that's a fantasy. Yeah. That's engagement. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Is it <laughs> So I feel like this discussion has been hovering on, on the edges of another very, very big related debate, which is about the place of intellectual work in our society today. And if I was to loop back to the question I posed before around transformation, um, I have in mind what I always saw as the cunning of John Howard, who was really the person who brought you know, the man in the pub as the expert to life and started to make that figure a profoundly central figure in Australian society and gave license to a new kind of public discourse that very, very insidiously was a part of marginalising academic expertise, mm. yeah? So if we agree that that's something that's been a part of a transformation of the public sphere that brings us to this crisis now, and this is me, the, the kind of the activist, sort of wanting to rise us up again now as we come <laughs> towards the end of this discussion, what can we do to reclaim the public sphere? Okay, so you've been talking about fighting. What about if I want to push back and say, well, we're in an environment of militarization, where governments are, 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 are militarizing society left, right, and center. I don't want to fight. I want to, you know, see the integrity of the work that we can do as thinkers, writers, debaters, as something that needs to find its way back into a rightful place in the society. Is there the, the possibility for some kind of a political movement around those ideas, given all of the discussion that is making clear that university has, has itself been a cunning player in um, taking that mode of engagement, a different mode of engagement, one that doesn't have a capital E, out from underneath us? Are you raising this? Or I'm, are just, you, I'm just are showing you. Are you, are you, yeah, we have are you saying this is going to be the next conference you're going to organise? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a great question. And um, I think there is reason for hope to, raise, to answer the point you made before. I think a well-worn cliche is sometimes the darkest hour is right before the dawn. I think the fact that we are seeing intensification of racism, intensification of militarisation, 
repression, war shows that the system is not strong. It is in crisis, possibly a very profound crisis, but it's not going to mm. topple of its own volition. Capitalism has proved itself very resilient time and again. But I think um, one strategy for intellectuals and for activists is to engage with new social imaginaries and practices and ideas that are coming back, such as the commons, such as sharing economies, such as post-capitalist thought and imaginary, and how they're embodied in material expression. So two really hopeful stories, and this can be a strategy of another piece, responding to hate with love and hope conquering fear, um, and perhaps the best expression of what Australia can be. Um, examples that I'm directly connected to in Mildura, where a conservative landowner has shared his property with a group of Burundian migrants who've been relocated there from Adelaide, who are growing food for themselves, for their families, and creating a social enterprise around that. And something similar that's happening in Long Worry, outside Pakenham, where another conservative uh, fourth generation white farmer is sharing their land with a group of African families from five different nations. Again, singing, dancing, growing food for themselves, their families, and speaking very movingly about the connection that means to them, feeling connected to this place, feeling included, uh, and feeling a sense of possibility for themselves and their children. Um, to me, those kinds of stories can be a very powerful response to a discourse and politics of xenophobia and hatred and racism and fear, perhaps better than you know trying to fight them in a in a warrior spirit with discourses of criminalisation or, or whatever it might be, because. You know, to me, that is you know, a hopeful expression of what Australia can be. You know, sharing property, uh, sharing resources, discourse around across culture, across tradition, connecting around food and place. Are you Nick Rose? Yes. Fantastic. So Nick has just given a great spruik for next week's talk, <laughs> which is um, some that of That wasn't my intention. No, no, no. I'm going to bring you in at, at this point. Next week, at the same time, we have a panel um, that will include Nick and Stefano De Pieri um, from Stefano's restaurant in Mildura. Um, Chris Mays, who's the author of, of, of the book at the centre of our discussion, is eating a settler colonial act. So please come back for that. But I just want to give our speakers one moment, perhaps, if they would like to respond to your provocation or, or anything else that's gone on, and then we will um, And I have one more question. And then after we take that one more question, we will have some wine. Well, I just, I mean, I'll just very quickly say, I liked what I heard, but I don't accept at the end where you engaged in a classic either or. <laughs> sort of like where you said, instead of, I don't see why we need to think instead of. Uh, we are not in a position to engage in instead of at the moment. We want to gather everything that is good and not some kind of like create some, oh, that's fantastic, but that's not. Uh, that. um, I just wanted to respond to what you were asking around um, around what next for the kind of the intellectual project. And I and I, I, I take the point around the kind of conservative um, heralding of the man of the pub. Um, but uh, but I think that actually the tradition of of um, of critique of the expertise of institutions and in particular academic institutions really arose from the feminist movement of the you know earlier um, and the indigenous self determination movement earlier, which which really called to attention the vast kind of and gross um, injustices that were occurring at the hand of so called experts. So I, I, I'm not sure that we need to fear kind of um, the disquiet around um, and knowledge making expertise, um, but the task is then what we do around that and and along what axis that is being um, uh, the, the, uh, the critique is being made and and with that I'm not sure that the resolution is a kind of um, imagined holistic rational public which we can all kind of engage in equal footing I think um, again that's been so easily shown to to be riddled with exclusions and expulsions, and so um, perhaps you know, in in perhaps Gassan's point then about you know the need to include lots of things, you need to kind of think across a range of different imaginaries and possibilities to bring together a range of different possible publics, if you like, in a discussion in a hopeful um, future. Thank you. Wonderful question. Um, was more of a comment? Yeah, please. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just wanted to respond to like some of the pushback against criminalization and fighting because I find it like I find people who don't understand why we need it is because they're so comfortable and privileged that they can't see the threat that's coming. Mm. So I don't see it as a grim future actually. I see it as mm. the present is like it is grim. We're living we're living it like our people are the ones who are being killed, not you know, um, Nazis and fascists aren't going after white people. And also like um, Pauline Hansen shouldn't be on TV. They need to be deplatformed. They need to not only be deplatformed from TV, but like from all places. That, um, you know, Nazis and fascism should not be safe. That's the only way to push back against it. And on Q and A, for example, Jordan Peterson was invited. Um, Milo was invited, and we saw like just over, um, I think it was the weekend, where there was a synagogue shooting, and um, the white nationalists quoted like cultural uh, Marxism and. You know all these ideas coming from even someone who's conservative like Jordan Peterson so like this idea that oh we don't need a fight or we don't need criminalization I just find it really you know a really privileged position to, and coming from a really privileged place like we should fight actually if we're not fighting now then when are we gonna fight